Okay, so now let's begin our today's class. Uh, so first, uh, thank you very much for all of your participation in our midterm survey, and I read many of your very valuable comments. Uh, uh, so some of you uh, posted the homework solution on the guys so actually they already be posted. So if you checked the resource tab and for each homework, so the solutions that already has already been there. So please check that. And uh, also some of you ask to provide more materials for the pipeline. The, so as I emailed to you last week, so there's some more slides from my previous course have about the pipe basic pipeline that have been posted on Sakai. And uh, also, uh, some of you ask for more examples on the uh, in 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 the slide. So so I will give the, the examples uh, to help you to better understand those very abstract concept. And again, thank you for your participation. It is very very useful. And uh, uh, today we will continue the lecture eight and, uh, and I already posted the PowerPoint slides on Sakai. So this is not the PDF because uh, as you will see in our today's lecture, so we will go through very detailed examples of how the out of order execution works. Any questions? No questions? Also, by the way, so uh, some of you already sent me your uh, team information and uh, uh, if you already determine that uh, you want to team with someone or if you want to team with someone or just do the pro uh, final project by yourself so please uh, send me the information And in the about the mid mid of November, I need to collect those informations and to have a, a rough understanding. So, how about the status of your final project? So which category you want to choose, and how about your your team conditions? So once you ask are the scores for online quiz released, I think so. So have you already seen your score for your online quiz one? Hello? Uh, Professor, I can't see the scores for the online quiz one. It shows any. Oh, so none of you can see the online online the score of the the quiz one. I don't think so. It's okay, not I will check that. I, I I will I will check that and release to the class. I want so that it already be released to you. So. Sorry for this mistake. Yeah. 
So, but you can see the score for the homework, right? Okay. So can you see like a, a tab with like the grade book in your Sakai account? The grade book. Yeah, so I'm not sure in your grade book whether you can see your online quiz score or not. Yes or no? Okay, okay. I will check that. I will check. Maybe I forgot to release that to you. Okay, so now let's continue for the lecture eight. And uh, here is what, uh, where we were last Friday. So we talk about so the motivation of the, the out of all the execution. Why we did that? You can you can always do the in order the normal processing, but the latest performance is a problem. And especially so when you have to store the the discussion at a very early stage. Okay, and then we have the solutions, the very high level description, the so-called out of all the overall execution, and uh, some of the key points. Notice that the philosophy here, the design philosophy so this, for this out of all the execution, actually that is to move the dependent instruction out of those independent ones. So we we don't want that those are the independent one. That those the innocent instructions be blocked by the data dependency of the other instructions. And to realize such ideas, some of the general key point first, we must uh, preserve some so-called uh, rest area or the more officially the reservation stations for those dependent ones. But for those dependent ones, as you will see that in the later detailed examples. So you, we understand that some of the instructions that depend on other instructions, so then they may have to like to wait. So that is okay. So then we have some place that to let you wait. And then, so please allow the other independent ones, they can be executed. And also for those that are to be weighted instructions, actually the reason why they wait is that they have to <coughs> wait the available values become true, right? For examples. So why we need to like to wait this ADD instruction is because this R3 values have to be available after the IMUL instructions, all right? And in that case that we need to know that when this R3 values become available, become updated, right? We need to monitor this one. And so that means that when we begin to let ADD instruction become to be weighted, locating the reservation st stations, we need to monitor the value of R3, right? To make sure that it will be updated. Once they're updated, we will notify the ADD instruction right now you can be executed, You're right? So this is a very natural idea, right? So we need to monitor that. And when it become available, we need to file with this so-called dispatch, like the to be the weighted instruction. Okay. So essentially you can see this kind of dynamic scheduling. Right. 
Any questions? Okay. So now here's a first example. Let's see what happened. What is the result? Actually, this is a result. And later we will result that how the out the out of order execution. And later we will see so how we achieve such type of the result. So first, let's consider this the, this original example here. So the first instruction is the, the multiplication. Second, the third is the addition. And the fourth one is again the multiplication. And uh, here we assume that for the addition, like we just need the one clock cycle for the execution. While for the multiplication, we assume that we need the four clock cycle. Okay. And then now let's see what happened. So First is that we use the normal processing, the in order processing. Okay. And the first instruction, we fetch that, right? First cycle, fetch this instruction, MUL. And then we decode that use instruction using one cycle. Right? And then we use the, the four cycles for the multiplication, right? And then one cycle for the memory and one cycle for the write back. Okay. So now let's take a look at what happened for the edit instruction. In the second clock cycle, we've, because the pipeline will begin to fetch that, right? And then decode that. And then notice that what happened. Because one source, one source register of the second instruction, it is actually the results of the, the first one instruction. So then we have to store here, right? We have to begin to store here. Store. Is that right? Is that right? And after it become available, We begin to execute this. Is that right? So you can just store three clock cycles. And notice that here we are concerned about we we are using the forwarding. Otherwise, we need to we need to store more cycles here. Begin to reactivate your instruction here because we already used the forwarding. So as long as that the result come out, we begin to, we forward that to the ALU, execute the addition, right? So we just store three cycles. Any questions? So note that, so, the two examples in today's lecture, it is a bit complicated. So if you have any questions, so just uh, unmute yourself and let, let me know. And here, this example actually is a, is a simple example. Any questions? No questions? Okay. And now then, the second, uh, the third instruction. In the clock cycle three, you fetch that, right? You fetch that, and then what happened? Also, it will be stored, right? Because your previous one is already been stored. And after several cycles, 
we resume that and we we'll begin to decode that. And notice that here, for the third instruction ADD, we cannot enter the, the de instruction decoding state here. This is because your previous one, the second instruction, this ADD, this ADD, it already it stores after the decoding instruction. So actually your ID EXE pipeline registers they store the they store the information instruction information of the second uh, the second instruction the, this add and because we need to store that so we cannot further decode the second add instruction the third instruction so it had to be stored here and after it begin to execute the set the second ADD, this is the, the second instruction. This is instruction one, two, three, four, five. After the instruction two, begin ex exit the decoding instruction, a uh, decoding phase, and become the, the enter the execution phase, and then your third instruction can act, can enter the decoding phase. Otherwise, the decoding information of this second instruction will be flushed by the third instruction. Okay, so it is stored again. Okay, and uh, and also that is reason why the fourth instruction cannot enter the instruction fetch phase because your IF ID pipeline registers have to store store the instruction information of the third one here. And that means after the third after the third instruction enter uh, enter to the decode stage, and then your fourth instruction can enter the fetch phase. And then for the first one, again, because it's a multiplication, you need the four or it is the, it is in the five, so maybe it's a mistake. This is, this is a mistake here. You need the fourth instruction, uh, four clock cycles here for the multiplication. And then, so again, because of the in order processing, we need to have them store. Because the source register for the instruction five, it depends on the destination output of the instruction four. Any questions? Not that here should be the 15 cycles, not the 16. We don't have this one. Any questions for the in order style? Or do you need me to explain some parts? No questions? Okay. So now then let's take a look at 
the out of order. So now that this is just the, this example is just the result once we perform some of the ideal out of order. Let's consider this again. Okay, and we index them one, two, three, four, five. So for the first instruction, we know that number one, so it just goes like this, right? Okay, now for the second instruction, the ADD. So fetch that, decode that. And now again, we know that it depends on the R3, depends on the R3 of the, the number two instructions. Depends on the first instructions, it's output R3. Okay, that's fine. Now we wait. We do not store, we wait. Wait till the three clock cycles, we can fire or we can reactivate number two instruction, right? Okay, so now here's the thing. For the number three instruction, the third instruction, ADD, again, F, we fetch that and notice that because right now we we adopted the out of order processing. So right now we, we can realize that. So for the it is version because it doesn't have the, any data dependency from the previous two. So it doesn't need to be stored anymore. Continue to decode that and uh, execute and write that. So no right to read data memory and then only write that. Any questions? So compare this one and this one. Okay, maybe you ask why are we here? We write, we, we perform the write back, update R1 at this place instead of this place. Okay, anyone tell me the reason? So W here, right? I mean, this means right back. That means you will, like in this example, you will write the new value of the R1 back to the register file where the R1 register is located. Why? Here, my question is why? Right back for the for the register R one is here. It happened here instead of here. Uh, is it because we still want to maintain the order for the like the second August, and we since it is not dependent on that, we just want to maintain the same order. Mm, it's a bit related, but not the exact reason. Mm. 
because this is not just for the consistency, but also for the like for the like to make it looks order something like that. So think about that. So take a look at its neighboring instruction. Any other opinion? I can give you some hints. So take a look at that. Which instruction at R1 is involved with operation? So right now you want to update, officially update the R1. Anyone here? Okay, so let me reveal the answer. So think about that. Let's take a look at the instruction two. So what is source register? They have two source register, R3 and R1, right? All right. So here the R1 is the what one? Is the old of R1 or the new R1? Old or new? Hello? Can you hear me? Old one, yes. This is old one. Right? And because till the questions uh till the instruction three we will have the new R1, right? So now think about that. So that means that what? For the execution stage for the instruction two, we want to execute that. We want to use like we want to input the R1 value and R3 value to the ALU. R3 here should be the new R3, R3 right? And R1 here is the old R1, right? 
But if you put the W here, So that means that you will update your R1 in the register with the new value, new R1 value. And it happened at the same clock cycle that, so right now you want to calculate the R3 using the old R1. If this two happens at the same clock cycle, it is not quite safe. It is not quite safe whether the R3 will use the old R1 or the new R1. I don't say that it will must be unsafe, but it is kind of the quite not ensure that we want to avoid such some uncertainty happen. Okay, so it's better to put that right backstage here. Is it clear? Any questions? Any questions? And also another reason is because think about that. If you have some other instructions here, and uh, if something happens that this W stage is also in this clock cycle. So then you have the simultaneous write to the register file. That is, it is not allowed it. Because you do not, you do not know what will happen previously. So typically by convention, we will like let a W place in this way. To ensure that every time, every clock cycle, you just have the one register right. And that's the reason why you use this W cannot be put here or be put here. If we put here, so they will have conflict of this W. If we put it here, it will conflict of this type. Any questions? Do you need me to explain again? No questions? I'm going to ask, explain the calculation of number of clock cycles again. So for which one? For the in order or the out of order? You mean the calculation of number of clock cycles? Uh, I have not uh, finished the why it have the 12 clock cycles yet. I have not to move to that part yet. So 
any questions about why the W should be placed of the instruction three should be placed here? Any questions about this? No questions? Okay, so then let's continue. For the instruction four, okay, for instruction four, again, so you can see that it's two source registers, they are not dependent on the output of the other previous instructions. So then we can just let it go through smoothly, right? And then for the register five, notice that because it's one of source register R three depends on the output. Oh, sorry, it's one of it's the source register of the register five uh, instruction five. Its source register R five depends on the output of the four. The fourth instruction, you can see that you will wait until your number four instruction gets a result, and then number five instruction can begin to execute. Right? So there's another way here. So totally, you can see that we have totally 12 clock cycles. As compared to the naive in order processing, we can achieve the, the lower latency. Any questions? So the, the student who just asked to explain the, how to calculate the number of the instruction, oh, number of cycles. So are you clear about this right now? Okay. So now let's take a look at to compare with these two, these examples. So we can see that it's actually the key part is that for the instruction three, right? Here yeah, we don't need to store, right? Instruction three can continue to work. Right? It's kind of out of order. Although your instruction two have to be weighted, but my instruction three, since it's independent, so actually I can just go ahead without considering your situation because I'm not dependent on you. So now, how we can realize this performance? So how can this be achieved? Now let's take a look at a, a detailed example. So again, so first, so some kind of the bit high level, but uh, not as high as this one. This is just to describe the key points. Right now, if, if you some more our detailed sort, you, you can you can view that how the pioneer computer architecture scientists how they view this problem, how to in enable such out of order execution. So, so first thing that, so notice that actually the reason why we have such the store or wait is because we have to the, Dependency here, right? And now, first, we need to identify those dependency, right? 
this this dependency is on the register, right? We just we can we can know that such dependency according using the register name, right? So we need to what we need to link the so-called consumer and the producer. Remember that what we talk about the concept of the consumer producer in the cache. And here the consumer here you can view that as the instructions true. Because it needs the it need to consume the, the new value of the register R3. While the producer is the instruction one because it produced the new value of the, the register R3. Right? And we need to link this two to let the processor know that this R3, that is will be used for this R3. So we have some tag there. And not just, notice that not just this dependent one. And actually, so during with one instructions, we know that R3, it needs the information of the R1, value of R1 and R2. So we also need to establish establish their relationship here. So how we use this tag, we are, I will show you that later. And the second that buffer the instruction. Buffer the instruction until they are ready to execute. And here like this one. For this instruction too, you can see that we buffer that to put it in the hold status until the R3 becomes available, then we can begin to execute, refile. We can begin to file, reactivate the instruction too. Okay. And again, so keep track of those readiness of the source values. And here we need to broadcast the tag when the value is is available. And for example, we know R three. Instruction two is R three depends on output of R three. R three we have some tag. That's some and after the R three has been available, so we are broadcast it. And if all instructions contain the same tag here, R three tag here, they will be notified that this R three right now is available. And then we will update using the new value of R three to execute re-execute the second instruction. Okay. And how to do that, we'll show you later. Okay. And uh, once all the source value of instruction become available, once we already updated that, and then we can begin the execution stage to the functional unit, just like here. At the beginning of this clock cycle, we know that R1, R3, these two source values right now, they're available, and then we begin to execute it. Similar here for the fifth instruction. At this clock cycle, we know R3 and R5, they're right now, these two source values, both of them are available. And then we begin to wake it up and then execute the register number five. Right? So this is some of the basic principles. And uh, so, yes, this is still a bit kind of abstract. So now let's take a look at some of the examples. One complete example. And uh, so this example is about this algorithm, Tomasulo algorithm. And uh, it is, it's a uh, researchers in the IBM and uh, invented this algorithm. And uh, 
such out of order execution, actually, they are kind of the used in almost all the high performance processors. And uh, from the Intel's, the AMD's, IBM's, ARM's, and so on. So, so you, typically, so when you take a look at the kind of the state of art uh, commercial processors in the spec, sometimes they'll mention that. So it will use the, the like the, the how many. So, so it some features of the out of order execution, and how many stages of out of order execution they can support and so. On. And this is a, a general uh, diagram. So first, for the fetch instruction, fetch instruction decoder, we are in order, and then so we have some scheduler here, and for the we are begin to the out of order stage, and then finally then back to the in order. And you have some of the scheduler can to coordinate these stuffs. And then this is the, the general organizations. We can see that have some the, the decode rename and the dispatch here. And uh, actually this algorithm that is to Discuss how to perform the, the rename and dispatch. And this is the original room. The first use of this algorithm that you see that introduced the so called reservation stations. Okay, so now let's see how it works. This is a simulation cycle by cycle example. And uh, for this the example, six instruction code segments. This is a program we will simulate. And we have some that, uh, we have some that, uh, uh, assumption that So we have the two operation units. One is the adder, another is the multiplier. Because here you have the two type of instruction, multiplication and addition, right? And uh, notice that we have the two reservations station IS. For the two different arithmetic units, and uh, also we have the register renaming table. And also we assume that for the addition, uh, the adder units and the multiplier units, actually here they have the separate data buses. This is all of our assumptions here. So now let's begin our simulation. So because this is very complicated, maybe we cannot finish in this class and then we will continue next class. So now, so feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions. Because this is a complicated, if you do it clear for one step, I will re-explain. Okay. Now, let's begin. So, at the beginning, um, nothing happened, right? And also, again, so for each register initially, they have some values, and their value is just equal to their numbers. Like R1, its value is 1. Initial, 
at the beginning, R2 is values to R11 is value is the 11. That is value we assume that already stored in there. Okay. Looks like one. So we fetch the first instruction. Right? Okay. Everything is fine. Looks like a two. Let's see what happened. So the first instruction begin to be decode, right? M U L. That can be again name the one, two, three, four, five, six. So clock cycle two, instruction one become decode, right? And the note is that, so it will be allocated in the reservation station for this place. This place, here, you know, this place. And step one, we'll check whether it's available. And then we access the register liars table. How is here? You can see that put the source register into the reservation stations. The R1 and R2, they are the two source registers for the instruction one, right? So it's source registers. We put that into the reservation station. See that? And again, for the second instructions, uh, sorry, for the second source, but I choose this one. They will put here. It's valid bit and it's value. We put it. Notice that here, this valid, that means that right now this value is available. It's, uh, it's available for, for the use. Any questions? And then you can see, then we rename the R3. This is the destination register for this instruction to the X. X here. And right now we mark it can become the invalid because right now we don't know the new value of R3 yet, right? Because we have not begun to execute this instruction. Is that right? Any questions? And here, using this way, you can see that we can now use it. in this reservation station. We know that so the there the link, right? The link between you know the x. This is R three. Actually, it needs the value of the, the R one and R two. Right? And those values right now is here. It's already available.
So now R3 is already been renamed to the X. And uh, once the R3, its new value has been calculated after several clock cycles. And then these new values, we will be identified by the tag X. And you will see that how we will use the X in the following instructions. Any questions? No questions? And notice that because for this X, so right now it's two values, source values are available, right? And we will begin to execute that in this next clock cycle, the clock cycle three. And then meantime, at clock cycle two, we begin to fetch the second instruction, ADD. Okay, so now let's have a look at what happened for clock cycle three. So for the first instruction, we know that we begin to execute that because this is the multiplication. It needs several cycles to finish the multiplication, right? So first we check that readiness, both source values, they are available, right? So we begin to execute this, right? And we dispatch it to the multiplication unit, right? And uh, notice that we assume that we need six clock cycles for the multiplication. And meanwhile, we begin at the clock cycle three, we begin to decode the second instruction. And for the second instruction, okay, notice that this is a addition, so we have another Reservation stations. Okay. And uh, notice that. So for this one, we will rename it the R5 to the app A. Okay. And now the decode, we will we know that one source registers R3. Okay, so now let's take a look at in this register the last table. R3, we know that it is its value is valid bit is zero, right? And its tag is X. We put the value X here, value with the tag there of the tag of R3 here. And another one is the R4. So R4, we know that is the value is the one, the value is four. So that's okay, so no tag here. And uh, rename R5 to the A. So we also mark that in the register alliance. R5 right now, its name is A. Any questions? Okay. And notice that here, 
for this second instruction, ADD, right now we cannot execute because in the next clock cycle, because one source value is not valid, right? One source value is, you know, it's X. X are three, it is not valid. X here, it depends on here, right? Not valid. Okay, so now, block cycle four, again, the first instruction, we continue to execute, we need six clock cycles to finish the multiplication. And because the second instruction in the register uh, in the reservation station, it, we have to wait that because one source value is not valid. And uh, for the third instruction, we begin to decode that. Right? We begin to decode that, and we know that it's R seven. Actually, we will. Destination is just R7 and has two source. It's one is R2, one is R6. And for the R2, we will put that here. And for the R6, we will put it here, two source here. And uh, R7, we will rename it to the B. And we know that because this two, this, this instruction, instruction three, in the reservation station B, because both of these two source rich, source values, they are already available, so we can begin to execute that in the next clock cycle, the clock cycle five. So you can see that now we can begin the out of order execution in the next clock cycle. Any questions? Then clock cycle five. Again, the first instruction continue to execute. And uh, the second instruction continue to wait. Third instruction. That in the reservation state ADD reservation stage B actually that respond to the R seven right the third instruction because these two values are already available source values are already available R two and R six so we can dispatch that to the ADD unit to begin the calculation it is we assume that it, it takes the four clock cycles. And meanwhile, in the clock cycle five, the fifth, the fourth instruction, we can begin to decode that. And again, so we know that we rename the destination registers R10, we rename it to the C. Back C here. And uh, so it's the two source register R8 and R9. 
So they are available. We put those information here, filled there. You can see it's also ready to execute in the next clock cycle. Okay, so this is the end of, of our today's class. So in the next class on Friday, we'll continue for this simulation, this complete simulation example. I hope that before that, already post this slides on Sakai, you can first review that by yourself and to take a look at so uh, how's everything going. And uh, you can see that it's very complicated. You can see that how the broadcast it will goes on. Broadcast the values and the, the, the table, the, the tag. We will go through this in the next, but it is, you can first take a look at that the slides by yourself. It strengthens your understanding. So, one thing that so because I need to attend a tech conference uh, just after this class, so I may not be able to hold office hour today. So I will send you an email to announce uh, another office hour slot in in this week. And uh, sorry for that because I need to present one paper in, in this conference and it will begin very soon. So it will have the conflict with our office hour. I will send you an email to announce another, another time for today, uh, for this week's office hour. Sorry for that. So, okay, so that is end of our today's class. So have a wonderful day.